We've got some folks trickling in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started with the introductions and um, we'll launch right into the presentations. Um, I'm Sarah Hansen. I'm the chair of the faculty assembly at UW Tacoma. Um, and it's our pleasure to co host this event. Uh, recognizing our Distinguished Faculty Awards at UWT this year um, with the Office of Community Partnerships. So we thought it would be a, you know, we're all online. We thought it'd be a really fun um, thing to, to, instead of having sort of separate awards that we kind of um, have one nice, fun, um, exciting ceremony for everyone. Um, so thank you all very much for coming and welcome. So I have um, Ali Moderas here, who is the Help me with your title, Vice Chancellor for Assistant Community. Chancellor. Assistant Chancellor for Community. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I am the worst title person ever. Me too. Okay. <laughs> um, it's here as well, um, just to recognize our um, Distinguished Community Engagement Award winners. Um, and, and of course, um, Faculty Assembly every year recognizes our uh, teaching Distinguished Teaching Award and Distinguished Research Award. Um, we uh, usually begin faculty assembly uh, meetings with a land acknowledgement, but I am told that Tanya Velasquez is doing one as sort of part of her presentation. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and do that at, at, at that point. Um, but I did want to give you a little bit of an overview before I go ahead and, and introduce everyone. So we're going to um, uh, go go through each presentation and then we'll hold the Q&A for the very end. So if you have questions as you go, um, maybe just keep track of them and then uh, towards the end we'll have a, a section on Q&A. So um, our first uh, Distinguished Faculty Award that we're recognizing is this Distinguished Teaching Award. Um, which recognizes a faculty member who demonstrates a mastery of their subject matter the ability to engage diverse students both within and outside the classroom and strives for innovation in course design. And the winner uh, for the 2020 Distinguished Teaching Award is Tanya Grace Velasquez, um, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Inter Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Uh, so I get to count her as a colleague. Um, Ms. Velasquez's teaching is recognized for using high impact community engaged teaching practices and individualized long term mentoring. She integrates knowledge of community and diversity into teaching and learning in the classroom and beyond. The committee noted that her commitment to equity and excellence is at the very heart of what she brings uh, the campus community. Tanya's presentation is entitled Cultivating Deep Hope, Teaching and Learning in a Time of Crisis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and announce uh, all of the award winners and before we go into the presentations. So our Distinguished Research Award winner this year um, uh, is uh, Ed Kolodzic. <laughs> Help me out, Ed. He's also my colleague and I'm terrible with his last name. Kolodzic, and it's totally fine. Like Kolodzic. All you, the time. Ed. Yeah. Ed, Ed and I came in together and I definitely have called him Ed ever since because I've never managed to get that right. Ed Kolodje is an associate professor in the School of Interesting Arts and Sciences. Um, his research includes um, achievements in the area of water quality and contaminant fate uh, uh, transport and transport. Um, he also engages with local and regional water quality efforts through the Center for Urban Waters. The committee recognized his impressive record of service as the principal investigator on research grants and acknowledged his extensive publications in high impact peer reviewed journals and service on advisory and journal editorial boards. Um, our uh, oh, Ed's presentation is entitled Roadway Runoff as a Source of Toxic Contaminants to Surface Waters. The Distinguished Community Engagement Award is given an annually and recognizes the important and innovative community engaged and community based work by faculty at the University of Washington Tacoma. Such work is based on an ethic of mutual benefit in which both the community partner and or public and the university, its faculty and or its students benefit in ways not possible without the partnership. This work may be short or long term and may be with a single uh, partner or multiple partners and should have been active within the past three years. 
It may be focused on teaching and learning, research, policy, citizenship building, creative work, or community building. And in 2020, we had two recipients of this award. Uh, Dr. Katie Baird of the School of Inter Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences represent this year um, with, <laughs> with the award winners. Um, and Dr. David Reyes, uh, an assistant professor in the School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. Um, Dr. Baird is not able to join us today. Um, she's doing amazing uh, re uh, service right now um, in hiring two new faculty. Um, but we do have uh, Dr. Reyes with us and his presentation will be using an equity lens for authentic community engagement. So without further ado, I will pass the mic over to uh, Tanya Velasquez uh, to give us her um, Distinguished Teaching Award presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And if I talk at this level, does that work for everyone? Or does anyone need me to raise my voice a little? Raise your hand or let me know verbally. Okay. And I have my um, side screen open just a little. I will continue to sort of scan. Um, feel free to jump in with comments or questions. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to do a small breakout for discussion uh, in about, you know, the next 20 minutes uh, that we spend together, 20 to uh, 25 minutes. All right. Here we go. Um, and so again, I want to make sure also, can everyone see this PowerPoint slide? And if you can't see the slide, will you let me know? And I take silence to mean that we're all good. All right, um, so I want to start with a living land acknowledgement. This is adapted from our own UWT School of Education. Um, also, uh, colleagues that I work with uh, through the community college system, Bellevue Community College, and also um, some of our good folks up at UW Seattle. The University of Washington Tacoma acknowledges the Coast Salish people and the Puyallup land, which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands since time immemorial. We have a moral responsibility to fully acknowledge indigenous communities, including those displaced and unrecognized, as well as critically reflect on the histories of dispossessed and forced removal by settlers and our government, which has allowed us, has allowed us the growth and survival of this institution. With gratitude and humility, we commit to creating reciprocal partnerships that honor indigenous cultures and ways of knowing and recognize their significant contributions to the broader community. We do so by respecting the agency and sovereignty of First Peoples, prioritizing care for the land, demanding justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women, and disrupting ongoing practices of settler colonialism. Oops. I also want to take a moment to um, express some personal acknowledgments. First, thank you to the committee. Um, it was a real honor to receive the award. Thank you to the folks who coordinated today, Andrew, Sarah, and others. Thank you to my audience, those who are here today for a conversation. I know I'm amongst friends, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing my message with you. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, who I am and who my people are. Um, I am the granddaughter of Chu Mu Fang and John Lee. Joseph Santoyo and Concepcion Gomez. My parents are Sing Lee and Carlotta Santoyo. My husband is Michael Velasquez, and my children are Antonio Kainoa and Malia Velasquez. These are my people, and they're one of the reasons why I'm here today. I'm also here today to express gratitude for my UWT colleagues and for scholars who have informed my teaching practices like Bell Hooks, Derek Bell, and Pablo Freire. They've shaped generations of teachers uh, that strive to create sites for social transformation and liberatory learning, um, which has really become my North Star in terms of how I do my work. And most importantly, I'm here today because our students who have taught me more than I can ever teach them about humanity, righteous anger, and radical love, um, I'm here for them today. Uh, they inspire me to create spaces uh, that um, really create deep change. So I wanna say thank you to our students. All right, um, so I felt like I worked on this for months and also last minute. Andrew knows that I really 
grappled with a title and a topic and a theme um, as we're, we're sort of watching global and national dynamics unfold and what it means to us as educators in the classroom, especially um, in courses that are organized around themes of social justice. Um, and so um, I finally landed on this idea of cultivating deep hope, teaching and learning in a time of crisis. Um, and what this really is, is um, the most challenging part of my work. It's one of the things that keep me up at night. Um, if I had decided to share about the things I do well in terms of teaching, um, the talk would be much shorter, right? Uh, so I'm emphasizing how to cultivate deep hope and in particular with our black indigenous and other students of color because the moment demands it. Our students of color are hurting right now um, so are our allies. Um, they are confused, they're angry, frustrated, and they're seeking answers. They want critical conversations that cultivate more, uh, more than just beatitudes and good intentions. So we owe it to them to name the moment as Kevin Kumanshiro inspires us to do. Um, and so we have to begin to name the moment. We have to begin by asking the question, what is the crisis? Right, what is the crisis? Um, and so let's begin in our own backyard. We have an opportunity gap. More students of color are attending college than ever before, but there continue to be racial disparities in college completion and persistence. Students of color are burdened with greater debt and black graduates have higher unemployment rates and lower salaries than their counterparts. And some of these conclusions uh, were a result of a 20 year study. We're also grappling with racial injustice and white supremacy. Um, I share this image uh, because a majority of my students do not know who Emmett Till was, but they do know who Trayvon Martin was and their stories are so similar, right? The men who um, ultimately admitted to killing Emmett Till were never convicted and George Zimmerman was also acquitted. Um, Emmett Till's death um, was one of the reasons for the civil rights movement and Trayvon Martin's death was one of the reasons for the Black Lives Matter movement, which began in 2013. Another crisis, income and wealth inequality in, in the US. I think the graphic says it all, um, but I'll read this anyway. At 171,000, uh, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. And that was in 2016. As a result of the pandemic, oh, those numbers have increased in disparity. We also have the Me Too movement. Tarana Burke, who founded the movement and coined the phrase uh, back in 2006. Um, and then also Alyssa Milano in uh, 2017 um, really indicates the ways in which we're still grappling with gender inequality, sexual and physical abuse of women and children. And we have the present moment, indigenous black and Latinx people in the US were at least 2.7 times more likely to have died of COVID than white Americans adjusted for age in 2020. And then this happened just two weeks ago. Uh, so in this sort of <laughs> five slides, I don't know about you, but my anxiety is already like increased. Um, and I'm going to ask the audience to jump in. What's missing? I mean, these were just a number of uh, crises, right, uh, that I can touch on. But uh, I want to ask you, what's missing from this row of slides? What else are we struggling with as a society? Does anyone want to say or maybe put it in the chat? Oh, we're going crazy in the chat. Okay. All right. I'll Library of the chat, Tanya, would that help? Yeah. Um, policing, children separated at the border, lack of attainable housing, 
uh, mental health, climate change, opioid crisis, environmental destruction, maternal mortality of black women, disinformation, a drug war, catastrophic forest fires, just to name a few. Right. And if I had listed all those in my slides, I think I'd be done by now and we'd all be just a little bit more devastated, right? And it's really painful to name it all um, in this sort of collective way. Um, so, you know, um, I just want to say, take a minute, like we're just going to breathe and inhale and exhale and think about how it feels to name, right? Name the moment, to name all these crises that intersect, that overlap. Right. Um, again, I mentioned there's anxiety. It's frustrating. There's also a sense sometimes for us of, um, if not resolve on some days, sometimes hopelessness even, right? And feeling like, what can I do individually? Um, uh, and in my case, with the course content I teach, also this sort of through line, right? Or this thread that runs through it in terms of the ways all these large social issues of inequality impact communities of color, black and indigenous, as well as women and people from working class and uh, spaces of, of poverty, right? And so that's always sort of, right, the, um, the train of thought that I'm working with as I um, engage with our students. Okay, and so we sort of just wanna reflect on that for a minute, um, which brings me to the challenge and the point of this talk, right? Um, I hold on to this quote by Dr. Derek Bell, and I've continued to return to this over the years. The challenge throughout has been to tell what I view as the truth about racism without causing disabling despair, right? And these crises that we named certainly um, foster despair, right? So there's a set of pressing questions um, for us to reflect and discuss. In light of these grave realities, do we have an obligation to teach hope? And if so, why? And how do we cultivate hope in our teaching and learning? So I'm gonna ask you to be interactive with me and actually take um, about 30 seconds to a minute to just jot down some of your initial responses to this question. Uh, and if we have the function available to us, I'd love to put you in small groups to discuss your reaction to the questions. And then we'll come back to talk about how to cultivate deep hope. So about 30 seconds to a minute. Just think about these questions. And Sarah or Andrew, um, do we have the option to move into? Break Sarah? us out. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll just do that for um, just maybe three minutes. I know that's not a lot of time, but I'm watching the clock.
Tanya, we can't hear you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. All right. I think everyone's starting to return. Um, just a comment or two, some of the uh, themes that you discussed, responses to the prompts. Feel free to verbally share. I'm not able Lean to- Lean on Amanda Gorman. Yeah, <laughs> right? Oh my goodness, what an inspiration. Um, uh, my group talked a lot about, yes, we have a responsibility to teach hope in what ways make sense to our, our disciplines, but also um, that it, we actually selfishly and in the most loving way, you know, glean hope from our students, right? And I think and Amanda Gorman, such a wonderful representative for the generation that that were many of the students that we're working with. Um, yeah, brilliant. Uh, and so then the other question becomes, how do we cultivate hope in our teaching and learning? Um, and I know you talked about that too, uh, but we'll continue to move on. I want you to hold on to those questions. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of deep hope, what it is and what it isn't. Um, this is really important. Um, and this work is derived from Dr. Andre Willis, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Brown University, Dr. Derek Bell, who's no longer with us, Bell Hooks, um, and of course our students themselves. So the opposite of deep hope, right? What deep hope isn't um, is, uh, it, deep hope is not want and desire, okay? It's not just wishful thinking. And deep hope, um, does not refer to specific future aims or an emphasis on positive outcomes alone, which ultimately means, right, um, deep hope is not saccharine or superficial or frivolous or romantic or even excessively optimistic, right? It's not that sugar coating uh, that sometimes we may express or even experience. And often it occurs when maybe we're at a loss for words or we're um, experiencing some discomfort uh, in even naming the crisis or having to stick with some of those that material for very long. And certainly we can do that through our disciplinary lens, but when we bring our emotion and our feelings and really the weight and the gravity of these crises, um, it can be a burden. It can be a lot to bear in a classroom. Uh, and yet our students are also carrying that too. Um, in the course content I teach, which frankly is quite depressing, um, students will often, you know, and there's a pattern right over that sort of 10 week period, students will talk about, you know, finishing the class and just weeping um, or feeling really down for the rest of the week or carrying a, a, a deep sense of uh, anger um, as they're learning the truth and the reality about race and racism. And to respond with a kind of superficial hope, I think would be disingenuous and it doesn't serve our students well. And so we really want to avoid that and try to foster a kind of deep hope. So the question is then what is deep hope? Um, deep hope is generous. It's a very present disposition. Uh, even though we're thinking about the future, it's more so about bearing witness and being frankly present to despair, um, not because we want to leave our students disabled with despair, um, but uh, Martin Luther King and Andre, uh, Dr. Willis suggest that deep hope is actually an outgrowth of despair, not its enemy. That these two things go hand in hand um, and that there's actually a real promise in cultivating deep hope if we're being deeply truthful and honest about the roots of despair and what causes despair. And in this case, we're talking about social, political, economic, and cultural inequality in all these crises that we named earlier. Um, deep hope neither ends the despair or overcomes it. It's always partially disappointed because it's a part of our human condition. And so there's an element of acceptance, not defeat, but uh, being you know, what Derek Bell calls radically real or a kind of radical realism and honesty about our collective reality. Um, and that's a more honest place from which to inspire change, right? From which to have the conversation if we're being, if we're naming those complexities as our group just talked about, 
um, about the problems um, so that we can be more mindful about solutions. So how do we cultivate deep hope in our teaching and learning? Um, as educators, we're called to have the ability to engage those hard questions. And we really have to ask, what does that require of us? Regardless of your discipline or field of study, um, there are hard questions that present themselves um, both about the content, but about the relationship of the content to our larger communities um, where harm can occur. Um, for me, sometimes the hard questions are um, ones that I won't answer now, but my students will ask really tough questions like, do you think race and racism will ever end in the United States? Um, and because I want to operate and move in spaces where I'm cultivating deep hope, I'm not going to give them a trite answer or an aspirational answer. Um, and this is the work, you know, the scholars, uh, race scholars grappled with this, right, and naming and defining whether or not that's even possible. Um, and so, right, the work that it requires of me is to really uh, do be grounded in theory think about my field, think about what that means to students and to be mindful about the timing of how and when I answer that question and what it means to the soul of our students. Because when they ask those questions, they're not trite. I mean, they ask with real sincerity and earnest. Um, and I have to think about when it's the right time to really have that conversation. We need to practice vulnerability and gratitude. I think we all know what that means. Um, we need to emphasize the balance and tension between despair and hope and hold space for reflection when we can acknowledge the contradictions. We need to encourage collective care for one another and we need to explicitly discuss the value of knowing the truth. And um, I wanna talk about Ta-Nehisi Coates for a moment who of course folks know is a um, award-winning journalist who's really, whose work has really received a lot of recognition in the last five to eight years. Um, he was an interview, in an interview with Terry Gross on NPR back in, I think, 2016, 2017, um, as the Black Lives Matter movement continued to gain momentum. And of course, his research is around issues of reparation, looking at the continuing and ongoing impact of institutionalized structural and systemic racism. And she asked him, um, you know, it, does it cause disabling despair? Like, do you feel hopeless, right? When you, when you uh, investigate and do this sort of research? And he actually said, no. He said that he actually um, was quite inspired and, and, and hopeful, even though the results of his research were pretty devastating. Um, and she was struck by that. Uh, and he explained why um, the, the, and in fact, he, you know, and it's probably a critical space, but he said that he's not so sure um, about Martin Luther King's aspiration of the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, he said he's not convinced of that yet, and the history doesn't um, demonstrate that. But um, that truth that he's aware of about race and racism uh, allows him to externalize and not internalize, right? He said, and in his own words, he said, I don't feel crazy anymore. I don't feel gaslighted. I understand the root of the problem and it doesn't begin with me. And he said, and that's where I find hope um, because the truth is more liberating than any sort of dream, um, any sort of trite comments such as what we heard after January 6th, that narrative of this is not who we are, this is not the America I live in, that sort of right romantic narrative, um, that can really feel like gaslighting to people of color in this country. And so, um, you know, this, this is what I'm getting at, right? That deep hope wouldn't propagate that sort of narrative, right? That sort of romantic narrative. Um, and so there's real value in that. And I bring this up because I do know that, um, and again, I believe that issues of race and racism run through all of our disciplines that we do, we do owe it to ourselves to develop some racial literacy and to be able to speak to these matters um, consistently for the sake of our students. So for me, the work and the challenge is how to achieve balance, right? I will always be challenged um, 
to not cause disabling despair. And I think, and I wanna emphasize the key word being disabling, right? I will teach subject matters that incite despair, um, but I don't want it to be um, disabling, right? And so the way to do that and to think about that is to teach, in, in the words of Bell Hooks, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students which is essential if we need to, if we want to provide the necessary conditions where the most deep and intimate learning can happen. So with that um, approach and with that thinking, um, I want to share one last thing. And this is um, a piece that I share with most of my students when we're done um, as a way of giving them um, a way to move forward, right? After we do the hard work of, of bearing witness, of telling truths and really sitting with that sort of um, reality and, and holding space for the kind of gravity um, that our coursework um, uh, really fosters. So um, the goal for me then is to inspire creative maladjustment. And some folks are probably familiar with Herbert Cole's work um, his book, I Won't Learn From You, but Creative Maladjustment is also Dr. Martin Luther King's work. Um, so um, before we close, I just wanna read um, some excerpts from Herbert Cole about creative maladjustment and deep hope. When it is impossible to remain in harmony with one's environment without giving up deeply held moral values, creative maladjustment becomes a sane alternative to giving up altogether. Creative maladjustment consists of breaking social patterns that are morally reprehensible, taking conscious control of one's place in the environment and readjusting the world one lives in based on personal integrity and honesty. That is, it consists of learning to survive with minimal moral and personal compromise in a thoroughly compromised world and of not being afraid of planned and willed conflict if necessary. It also means searching for ways of not being alone in a society where the mythology of individualism negates integrity and leads to isolation and self-mutilation. It means small everyday acts of maladjustment as well as occasional major reconstruction, and it requires will, determination, faith that people can be wonderful, conscious planning, and an unshakable sense of humor. Creative maladjustment is reflective it implies adapting your own particular maladjustment to the nature of social systems that you find repressive. It also implies learning how other people are affected by those systems, how personal discontent can be appropriately turned into moral and political action, and how to speak out about the violence that thoughtless adjustment can cause or perpetuate. There are risks in becoming creatively maladjusted. You might get fired or find projects that you have nurtured into existence, destroyed by a threatened bureaucracy or school board. You might find yourself under pressure at school and at home to, make, to stop making trouble and feel like giving in to the temptation to readjust and become silent. The choice of when, where, how, and whether to maladjust is both moral and strategic. And though it has social and educational consequences, it is fundamentally personal and private. Walking the line between survival and moral action is a constant and often unnerving challenge. We have to think about being part of an opposition within the system and be articulate and explicit in that role. We have to reach out and develop allies and not be afraid to encounter and confront. And we must remember and affirm what we often tell our children, that we can become the people we would like to be, that it is necessary to live with deep hope, and that is, it is possible to create a decent life and a decent world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. We can share our appreciation with real or virtual clapping. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, again, remember, we're gonna take questions for Tanya at the end. So now we'll move on to Ed, um, your presentation. Uh, I lost the title, I'll let you give it to us. No problem. Can everybody see this? We good? We got a presentation? Yes. 
Yeah, um, thank you, Tanya, for that uh, inspiring and interesting presentation. Um, I myself, I'm also going to uh, deal with some difficult societal challenges here and have some despairing pieces in my presentation. But I think one of the common themes that unites maybe Tanya and I, and I'm sure many other people here, is that um, we wrestle with these tough situations, these, these tough problems, so we can find a way to solve them by understanding them better. And I think um, if, you know, if, if you learn one thing from me, it's kind of like maybe some of that work over at Center for Urban Waters on the other side of Thea Foss is designed to help um, make the world a better place, which I think was one of last, uh, Tanya's last comments and thoughts um, by, by understanding exactly what the problem is. So first I'd like to really thank a whole bunch of people. Um, I really should have an entire slide full of collaborators and co-authors and co-presenters here. Um, I've had wonderful postdocs over at Center for Urban Waters like Jen Yutian and Catherine Peter. Um, I have a bunch of, um, I've had some graduate students work on this project from UW Seattle. And then many, many um, UW Tacoma undergraduates and people who graduated UW Tacoma and work with us as technicians. So there's been um, lots of UW Tacoma hands on this research. I'd also really like to acknowledge and respect uh, Jen McIntyre and the WSU Stormwater Center over in Puyallup as being just really critical collaborators for all this work. Um, Jen and her group did all the fish exposures and the toxicology type studies you've seen. Uh, NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service with Nat Schultz and kind of those groups up in Seattle have also been big important contributors here. So um, I'm speaking here as a representative from many people who um, together kind of have been working on this issue. Um, so yeah, so I'll start with my um, little bit of environmental problem, environmental despair. I think our, our general issue here is why can't uh, fish and people coexist? And what I'm going to show here is what happens to coho salmon, adult salmon, uh, in Pacific Northwest uh, urban or near urban creeks in the fall. Uh, if you know anything about salmon, they're these big, beautiful fish. You know, many of you have eaten salmon. Um, you know, you'll go to the store and buy one and put it on your barbecue for some sort of celebration or a special event. Um, and so salmon uh, are born in freshwater. They grow in freshwater. They leave that freshwater system. In the case of coho salmon, after maybe a year, they leave, they go out to sea, they get really big there, and then they come back and they reproduce and then they die. And so that's the salmon life cycle, which has been perpetuated, you know, for tens of thousands of years uh, here regionally. Um, except there's a problem. If people, this is what happens to our coho salmon. Um, so this is a, a, a big, beautiful female coho salmon, probably in just a day or two from Puget Sound. This is in Miller Creek, so right near SeaTac Airport. So you've probably flown into SeaTac. Uh, this is maybe no more than five miles away from the landing strip, or even less probably, three miles away. Um, and what happens is that um, these salmon come in to reproduce and spawn and they're totally fine until it rains. But when it rains, something moves into the water that kills these fish within a few hours to a day or so. And uh, anecdotal reports of this issue extend back to the 1980s when people were noticing this happening to um, coho salmon in fish hatcheries up in Bellingham, Washington, up on the Canadian border. And then in the 1990s, um, Seattle Public Utilities and you know, local municipalities put millions of dollars into creek restorations to try and rebuild habitat for these fish. So one of the criteria for all that money that was being spent in this habitat restorations was that um, they wanted salmon to come back and spawn in this habitat they built for them. And so in the 1990s, you got a bunch of people out into these watersheds, specifically watching for salmon to return. And sure enough, the coho salmon came back. They started to spend time in this habitat, except when it rained, they noticed that those salmon, which were fine the day before, were dead, you know, 50 feet downstream from this location where they were watching them. And so over the last 25 years, you know, many 
tens, hundreds, even thousands of hours of effort have gone into trying to understand this urban stormwater mortality problem. Why is urban stormwater killing coho salmon? Um, and so, you know, it's evident that something was in that, that stormwater runoff that was coming off urban areas. Um, over time, it, it became understood that this was related to like roads and transportation systems. The more traffic you had, the more intensity you had, the more people were around, the greater the percentage of coho salmon that would die in some of these watersheds. Um, and by the way, I'll note that this uh, video, that Miller Creek is actually beautiful when you're down on it. We're, we're not talking about an, an urban creek that's full of trash and, you know, surrounded by skyscrapers and high-rise buildings that, where the water looks terrible. These are very pristine looking systems when you're actually standing down on them. You can barely tell you're near Seattle or near Tacoma. Um, you know, you, you almost have to struggle to see the houses up high on the bluff you know, above you. Um, there's no trash in there. The water looks great, but something in that water is pretty bad for the fish. Um, and then this video, by the way, is taken by a citizen scientist. So I got to Center for Urban Waters in UW Tacoma in 2014. I'm somebody who works on water chemicals and fish, trying to understand what chemicals out in the environment require treatment and management and, you know, intensive efforts to try and uh, mitigate their adverse impacts in some way. So I came to UW Tacoma in 2014 and everybody was talking about this stormwater killing fish problem. Um, and so I started to work with some citizen science groups and some of the research groups who had been working on this um, to understand how I might be able to help and what we might be able to contribute through our capabilities at the Center for Urban Waters. And um, a couple points here, just to um, reiterate some things I've said. In the most impacted systems, um, places like Longfellow Creek, which is kind of in West Seattle, up to 90% of the coho salmon die before spawning from this uh, urban runoff mortality syndrome, or ERMS. And um, that last 20 years of research established that we didn't know why this was happening. It wasn't pathogens or metals or pesticides or ammonia or dissolved oxygen or any of the other typical things that might kill fish. It was something unknown. Um, I'd also note that in these very same creeks, um, chum salmon in particular sometimes returned at the same time as coho salmon, but chum salmon would survive the same rainstorm that killed the coho salmon. So there's the species sensitivity aspect to it. Coho are more sensitive to whatever toxic uh, constituent is in these creeks um, that's, that's harming them very dramatically and yet seemingly not affecting the chum salmon. So over at the Center for Urban Waters, what does the Center for Urban Waters do? Um, we have a lots of um, analytical instrumentation and you know, research expertise to try and understand ecological health, water quality, environmental health, um, how humans are impacting our environment in particular so that we might be able to find better solutions in fixing and improving it. And so over at Center for Urban Waters, this is machine, um, which I've been using in my research for the last 10 years or so called a high resolution mass spectrometer. Um, don't get stressed out if you're not comfortable with chemistry, you don't like chemicals or you know, you're not um, trained in science. All you really need to know about this machine is it tries to detect everything in a sample. And so if you ever watch like CSI or any of these um, crime scene investigation type things, this is the instrument they use to try and figure out who murdered that person or you know where that fingerprint came from or what chemical you know was involved in, in some crime scene, right? So this is kind of a CSI instrument. Um, but if you watch TV, you know, they put the sample and they hit go and then like a minute later, they know exactly what it is. Um, we put our sample in there, we hit go and then maybe two or three months later, we might have a clue, maybe this big clue that uh, as to what it is. So in reality, none of that works quickly and easily. It requires a lot of hard work and effort and just people beating their heads against what the instrument told you to figure out what's going on. And so we just do a lot of beating our heads against data that comes off this instrument. And over time, um, illumination occurs a little bit. Um, so that's what we've been doing.
So we applied this technology to the coho salmon stormwater mortality problem. And we've been working on that now for six years, really. Um, and so one of the first things we tried to do is just try and understand what chemicals were always present if coho salmon died. So we, we did a combination of studies with um, Jen McIntyre's laboratory studies where she exposes coho salmon to roadway runoff, runoff from bridges, and knows that that induces the same symptoms of this mortality that's seen out in the field. And then we worked with citizen science groups who would literally call us up if they saw a sick fish in the water. So if a salmon was still alive and it was like flopping around and kind of in the process of perishing, which again is despair inducing, um, they would call us up and we would literally like jump in the car. We had like coolers ready to go. We had one stationed up in Seattle. I had one in my car. My postdoc had one in their car. We'd jump in the car and we'd go up and we'd collect the water samples that that fish was in. Again, trying to get like, this water is killing that fish, what's in it? So we did that um, and we got samples from those citizen science uh, community members who are out there spotting these fish for us in 2016 and 2017 and actually every single year since then. Uh, they still go out every fall to collect samples for us. And we found that there were, you know, our instrument typically detects thousands of chemicals in every single sample it looks at. But specifically, we found that anytime salmon were dying, there were like these 57 chemicals that were co-occurred in these mortality inducing waters. And notably, uh, almost all the more abundant ones were in some ways linked to tires and tire rubber chemicals. The chemicals that are used to make tire rubbers. And then when your tire rubber bit that's maybe left on the road after it wears off your tire, after rainfall touches it, some chemicals leach out of that rubber and into the stormwater, into the roadway runoff. And so we just saw a lot of evidence of roadway runoff derived pollutants and especially tire rubber derived pollutants um, in the first few years of us investigating this phenomenon. So this really started to validate, you know, some of these prior observations that roads seem to be important, traffic intensity seemed to be important. These are all based off like statistical correlations and GIS type comparisons. And our water quality data was telling us, you know, roads and tires seem to be really important. So Jen McIntyre in 2017 started investigating different possible chemical sources coming from roadways doing things like exposing juvenile coho salmon to uh, a dilution of antifreeze or windshield washer fluid, or any of these things that maybe somehow are part of your car, right? And the only chemical source that harm the coho, coho are incredibly tough. In fact, like things like brake fluid, like it, it, it couldn't kill them. Like they, they're just such tough little fish, but they're not tough if tire rubber is around. And so Jen McIntyre found in her studies that if she contacted ground up bits of tire tread with water, it killed the coho um, quickly. And so she did this study late in 2017 with um, adult coho and chum salmon that were returning to the Grover's Creek hatchery. So this is a hatchery run by the Suquamish tribe um, over near kind of Bainbridge Island area. Um, and so every year, coho and chum salmon come back to the hatchery um, and the tribe spawns them and you know, releases new ones. And so Jen McIntyre exposed adult chum salmon, which are quite large, some of them are 10 to 15 pounds, and adult coho salmon, which are a little smaller, often like five to 10 pounds, um, to uh, a mixture of tire leachate. So what you see in the video here, these blue columns are completely full of like ground up bags, a little bits of tire, kind of like the stuff that would wear off your tire after you drive it on the road. And uh, she made this big 1700 liter tank of tire leachate and exposed coho and chum to it. And if you remember uh, out in the field, coho salmon die in storms that chum salmon survive. So these fish are showing this really differential mortality impact. So Jen did that uh, a bunch of times in 2017. And what she saw was that um, in the control, which is just groundwater, no tires involved, all of the chum salmon survived and all but one of the coho salmon survived. So they were surviving this groundwater just fine. In the tire leachate, what's in black, all of the chum salmon survived the tire leachate 
exposure and all of the coho salmon died from that tire leachate exposure. So this really told us that this mixture of like urban stormwater and roadway runoff, which is incredibly complex, has thousands and thousands of chemicals in it. Um, something in there that was tire related was inducing all these mortality symptoms and the same types of behaviors that are seen when these fish die out in, in our creeks. So Jen knew at that point that something was in tires that was really bad for coho salmon. So what we've done for the last three years is try and figure out what that was. And we use something that's called a TIE or EDA. That's like an effects directed analysis. And it basically involves manipulating water quality to try and take chemicals out of it or move them differently. And then you expose that manipulated water sample to fish and you see, are they okay? Or do they die? And by doing this type of like iterative comparisons, you can kind of narrow down on what type of chemical killed the fish. And this is what's typically done to find a toxic chemical out in the environment. They use some mechanism like this of manipulate and expose, manipulate and expose. And you gain knowledge every time you do that. So it took us like two and a half years of this TIE process to gain that knowledge, right? And so one way to think of it is if you have some um, purple Kool-Aid that you know is toxic or bad for you, you can put it through a column and it removes the red. And what comes out is, is a blue Kool-Aid, right? And so you can then go and like expose that blue Kool-Aid to some fish, uh, in this case, juvenile coho salmon, and see if they survive or not. And by doing that, you know, was it the red or the blue? Is the toxic part the red or the blue, right? So think of it just as kind of like manipulating water quality composition that way. This is what it looks like for real. I'm not gonna to talk too much about it. When we make a tire leachate that's toxic to coho salmon, we see over 2000 chemicals in it. We did a first couple steps. We got that down to 1300 chemicals. We isolated the toxic fraction there. We manipulated it again. We got to 650 chemicals in it. Those were toxic, something in there was toxic. We manipulated it again, 225, manipulated down to 26. Our final manipulation, again, these are all in a row, took two and a half years to build this. We found a toxic fraction that just had four chemicals in it. And now we could really start to try and identify like, what are those four chemicals? We didn't have to divide our attention across 2000. We could figure out what was in these four. And what was in that four was this, our instrument tells us it had a chemical formula of C18, H22, N2O2, right? So we knew, the big chemical in there was this C18H22N2O2, which is basically unknown in the environmental literature. Nobody knew anything about what C18H22N2O2 was. And so we had to search around and try and figure out what it was. And finally, after we did this for you know six or eight months in 2019. And finally, in December 2019, uh, Zhen Yutian, my postdoc, figured out that it was related to this tire antioxidant, this compound called 6-PPD, which had a chemical formula of C18H24N2. And he found out that when 6-PPD reacts with ozone, which is why it's in your tires, um, it formed C18H22N2O2. So now we had a link between a chemical we knew it was that was added to tires and this chemical that was lethal to coho salmon in our lab exposures, right? And um, think of this as a preservative chemical for your tires. If you didn't have 6-PPD in your tires, you wouldn't be able to drive 50,000 miles on them. You would drive five or 10,000 miles and they would be broken up into little bits and you'd have to buy a new pair. And 6-PPD is in your tire to prevent ozone, which is an air pollutant, and it's present in all the air down near the ground. There's just a tiny little bit of ozone in that air. Um, if that ozone reacts with your tire, it breaks down your tire and kind of makes it crack. And 6-PPD is put into tires to basically react with the ozone faster than your ozone can react with your tire to make it more durable and safer for you, right? So we figured out that this transformation product um, seemed to be what was harming these fish. So we bought some industrial 6-PPD. That's what you see right here. This is the exact same stuff that's mixed into your tires when, you're, when they're making your tires. 
There's ozone flowing through this glass column here. We ground it up and we react it with ozone. It makes this little black layer. That's the transformation product. And what's up in that black layer is that chemical. The, uh, it's an ozonation product, right? And we saw that the chemical that formed after the ozone reaction was exactly the same one we were identifying in our toxic samples, right? Its retention time was the same. It, all its mass peaks were the same. You know, it just lined up. This is, this is a fingerprint, right? This is like a chemical fingerprint. These things are, now we know the, perpetu, uh, the perpetrator of this crime, that we've, we've got the fingerprint, right? And so we figured out what was really harming this fish is this chemical called 6-PPD quinone. Again, so 6-PPD is uh, added to your tires. And then as you use your tire, they react with that ozone. And so all the 6-PPD that's added to your tire ends up as the 6-PPD quinone, which was a chemical that's out in the environment, but nobody was paying attention to it. And when we gave it to fish, we found out that the 6-PPD quinone was indeed very toxic to juvenile coho salmon. This tank over here on the left, um, this has the purified 6-PPD quinone concentration added to it. And coho started to get sick in 90 minutes, 90 minutes after we added the 6-PPD quinone uh, in there. And um, they were all dead within about four hours or so. Meanwhile, the parent, con the parent compound, the 6-PPD, even at 20-fold higher concentrations, one, one coho salmon died after a day, and a second one was sick after one day at 450 micrograms per liter. Meanwhile, the 20 micrograms per liter, much lower concentration, made them sick or killed them within minutes to hours, right? So this really told us that 6-PPD quinone was very toxic to these fish. And in addition to that, we saw that the symptoms, like what these coho salmon look like as they die, match the ones we saw with the 6-PPD quinone exposure. So what I'll show you here is kind of one of our last bits of evidence. Um, this is an adult salmon in the lower Duwamish River um, that's, that's sick from this stormwater exposure. And you can see it's up on its side, it's kind of swimming in the circle. It's like gaping for air, it's taking these little breaths of air. And eventually they just lose the ability to swim and they kind of drop down to the bottom and then they slowly stop breathing, right? So that's, that's what the adults do out in the field. And then I'll just show you the juveniles in that 6-PPD quinone tank. And they're sitting, spiraling up at the top, gaping for the air. You'll see them do it again here in a second. Um, so again, that exact same behavior in the, in the juveniles from the 6-PPD quinone. So again, it wasn't just the concentrations that were telling us something was going on. All the behaviors and the way these fish acted and how they got sick and how long it took all matched between what's seen out in the field for the adults and what was happening in our lab exposures after we made that 6-PPD quinone from that tire chemical. Um, and then the last bit of data, we went and looked all across the U.S. West Coast for this. And we detected it not just in Seattle. Uh, it's present not just in Seattle roadway runoff, but also in Los Angeles roadway runoff. And all those concentrations in roadway runoff are, are above the toxicity threshold. So no coho salmon can survive exposure to roadway runoff uh, from a busy road. Um, and then we also saw 6-PPD quinone near that toxicity threshold, not just in Seattle, but also in San Francisco Creeks, telling you that, you know, these are areas which are chemically inhospitable to coho salmon. Like even if you spent millions of dollars on trying to restore the physical habitat and the spawning gravel and the logs and things like, it's, it's not safe for the fish because of this chemical. So that really made us all think, you know, um, what's going on with all that tire rubber that kind of wears off your tires? Thousands of coho salmon here in the Pacific Northwest are telling us it's important to think about how we manage and control and, um, and work with that. Um, coho salmon are definitely very sensitive to some of the chemicals that are used to produce tires. And we really need to understand the environmental fate of some of these tire rubber derived chemicals because of these types of impacts. 
And so I want to end on a positive note here, right? We're trying to figure out how fish and people can coexist, right? And the key question is, what are we going to need to change in our lives and all our consumer products to reduce our toxicity on the environment around us? Because that's definitely characteristic of a bunch of things that humans do. I'd like to see us get to a point where we can make salmon safe tires, tires that aren't just safe for people, which the manufacturers have done a wonderful job doing, but are also safe for the environment. So we have some work to do there. And I'm, I'm hopeful we can, you know, my deep hope there is we can get to a point where um, we all have salmon safe tires on our cars where we know there's none of those adverse ecological impacts. We have a few papers on this. Uh, we had one that came out in science last December, got a lot of attention. I'd point out it had five UW Tacoma, either undergrads or alumni as co-authors on that on the list. And then uh, our earlier paper had three UW Tacoma undergrads or alumni uh, working on that. So UW Tacoma undergrads have been huge parts of this research effort and really generated a lot of this really important data. And there's my team right there. Um, we're all at the climbing gym in Tacoma. I like to go climbing. Um, so this is just one of our group days pre-COVID. Um, and we had many collaborators and funders and people who helped. And I'd really like to thank them all. Um, that's it. That's what we do over in that orange building across the way. Uh, we try to fix water and help fish and help people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ed. That was uh, fabulous. Um, we can all uh, acknowledge um, Ed with a real or virtual clap. That would be great. Thank you. So our, our final presentation is our uh, distinguished community or one of our two distinguished community engagement award winners, uh, David Reyes. So David, I'll hand it over to you before we open up for Q&A. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I would like to also just first thank uh, really the community who I think my work really is uh, built upon and the success that I share with them. And what I want to do today is to just share with you a little bit of uh, how I have been um, in, in engaged in this work of community um, mobilization, capacity building, and developing leadership. Um, because I think really fundamentally that's at the core of what uh, I'm hoping to offer with the communities that I work with. And so I want to give you a couple, uh, a couple examples of how I've done that. Um, and as well as some reflections on what I'm calling my own mental model uh, around um, community engagement as it relates to equity. And certainly I just want to also say that um, we're in very different times and that uh, the way in which I had and I say had uh, engaged with my community is now changing um, with COVID. And so uh, I'm also in the process of reconceptualizing again, how does that work in this era of a pandemic in which uh, we can't be physically together and yet we're learning how to use technology. Uh, and I'm in the process of sorting that out. We all are, right? Uh, and so there's work to be done, particularly as we think post-pandemic as well. How do we recover from what now we are seeing in terms of the exacerbation of disparities um, and, and lost opportunity? Um, so let me just make sure I can advance here. Okay, great. So um, I want to first start. Um, so I am a nurse, so I have to, oops. Um, pay some homage to at least some of my four mothers uh, in terms of how I approach my work. And this happens to be a photo um, of uh, a nurse, uh, a public health nurse. I am a public health nurse. I have been it's my, in my bones. Um, and the foundation for the work that I do, which is in community and with, with groups. And that uh, part of the work in, I believe, of, of community engagement is going to the people. 
uh, and that how do we discover and understand the conditions in which they are living and trying to thrive and to have hope as we heard uh, from Tanya earlier you know is how do we how do we do, how do we inspire hope right and sometimes the face of adversity and this particular quote for me uh, is one I've sort of had as one of my compasses about uh, how it is that we see uh, uh, the world. And Lillian Wald, who was uh, one of the foremothers of our discipline, talked about that she seemed that, you know, there are conditions that were allowed to happen because nobody didn't talk about it. Nobody acknowledged it. And so I really see as part of my mission, my ethos is how to uncover that and to make uh, it known to those who can help to advocate and to support the communities that I've worked with. So community engagement, you know, I'd be curious, you know, how is it that you define community engagement? What does that look like? Uh, there's a lot of ways in which we can define it. Um, and I don't think that there's any one uh, definition. Uh, one that I have sort of uh, used as kind of a foundation, but certainly I think needs a lot of work, is the one in which we are collaborating with people. Um, and that can be through different kinds of affiliations, whether that's geographic, whether it's by interest, whether that's by identity or situation. Um, but it, it is also in terms of how is there a common purpose, a, a common um, sort of denominator, which, which then brings those folks together. Um, and certainly as a, a public health nurse, how is that uh, moving toward the health and well-being uh, of those folks? But it, it certainly isn't a perfect definition, and I think it is something that we continually need to work on. I think part of the missing uh, element of that is really the, the crux of how are we elevating community voices? And how is it that we are listening to uh, the folks that we work with? And certainly I'll talk about the folks in East Tacoma in just a moment. But one of the... Um, ways in which I've sort of come to this work of a community engagement was actually after uh, many years ago, I wrote, I read a book by someone by the name of Susan Kane, and I don't know if anybody is familiar with her, but she wrote a book called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World that Can't Stop Talking. And I thought about that, uh, that book for many years, and I continue to kind of go back to some of the central messages around how it is that folks who don't have either the capacity or aren't supported or just don't feel comfortable in, in talking about themselves and in, in, in expressing what is important to them are being heard. And when we talk about uh, working in communities who are disenfranchised, um, how is it that we are lifting up their voices in a way that um, not just resonate, but really are heard and understood um, and resonate and bring uh, value uh, to uh, what they say is important to them. Um, because we have kind of in our society, I believe, this, this bias around those who are uh, the ones who talk, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of an expectation that if you're you know, if, you, if you're engaging the world that you should be always talking about what's important to you and what you want to accomplish. So there's sort of this bias toward those who might be seen as quote unquote extroverts um, versus those who might be seen as introverts. And, and she really sort of talks through, really it isn't about, you know, that we're labeling, but it is how it is that we can regenerate and how do we express what is important to us. So that's been part of my motivation in doing this work is, is how uh, is it that we and how can I listen deeply and intently and learn from the community members, from the individual key leaders uh, that I, you know, that I, I talk with, I meet with, etc. And to what end and to what purpose. So, you know, there are a lot of ways in which we think we can engage uh, the people we work with, with, with communities. And this happens to be one framework that I have looked at and, and used um, uh, through my, my, my scholarship uh, around how is it that we look at engagement as a dynamic process. It's not a linear process. Certainly there are models, there are frameworks that you know uh, have a linear approach, but 
the reality is that we are working with people and relationships and, and that um, there's not a static place in which we can sort of say this is where engagement begins and ends. And that's going to change depending on who moves in and out of that circle uh, of, of, of folks. And that often, you know, when we talk about engagement, that we might start with this place of just being able to sort of seek um, um, information from, from a community to, to, to sort of basically sort of meet a need that we have. Um, and we might even go out and to uh, ask their opinion uh, versus say giving them a, a survey. So we're really missing part of the context uh, of what's happening. Um, we might even then move towards say, well, we actually want to involve the community in the work we're doing. And so have to then ask ourselves, well, what does that look like? How are we going to do that? And maybe even consider having the community and the participants actually make some of those decisions. We can then maybe think about how we might then move toward this, this uh, area of empowerment or sharing power, as I like to look at it. How is it that we actually might relinquish um, some of our positionality to actually share the, the, the leadership um, and, and the work uh, with the communities who actually have a greater stake in what is happening, what they have identified as particular issues or problems or strengths, et cetera. So um, I just share this just to perhaps spark your own thought about, well, how is it that you might think about engagement? How is it that you see yourself perhaps in this um, sort of framework? Where are you at and, and where might you actually move toward actually fully engaging a community or the folks that you are working with in, in the shared um, um, work and the shared priorities? And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So how do we start and where do we start? Um, I'm not expecting you to look at this slide and, and read the detail, but I want to share, in, um, several months ago, I had the, um, the privilege to talk with a group of planners um, who were interested in community health. And they said, well, we'd like you to look at our um, logic models and how we're trying to approach community planning because we're interested in health. And so, I reviewed their logic models, which is great. It's good to have kind of a plan to, to look at your work. But what I reflected back to them was the gap in where they weren't engaging and actually involving the community. And that um, it appeared to, at least from the outward that yes, they're very smart people. They knew what they were talking about. They had the experience, they had the mental uh, frameworks, et cetera. They had the resources to put a plan in place. But what was absent was the community's voice. And so um, I, I went back and I just reflected what you see here is that how is it that they might actually then engage the community in actually planning, in this case, change in the community in which they weren't necessarily living in, but we're going to affect the people in which we're going to actually basically um, perhaps uh, bear the impact um, of a community that they had no say in, in creating. So it's so all I'm really saying here is like, when we start beginning to think about engagement is how early on and when are we actually engaging the community and actually having them participate in the conversation? Where do we actually bring in those voices to begin actually thinking through, in this case, this particular project from beginning to end? This happens to be um, a project that I had been working on several years ago um, and uh, centered in East Tacoma, where we were wanting to find out from the community what were their priorities for livability. And uh, this was in uh, concert with my partner at the Seattle, uh, excuse me, the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, in which we were able to get some funding to um, uh, reach out and, and include and invite community members to be a part of the planning process uh, and to find out uh, what was important to them in terms of livability. 
And uh, the process was that we were able to bring them in, have them actually um, to develop questions with us, and then actually have community members um, uh, facilitate conversations with their neighbors, which provided them an ability to actually then talk to each other neighbor to neighbor versus say me as a faculty member or someone from the health department come in and do that work who don't necessarily have that relationship. And so at the same time, we compensated these community members for their time with money. We actually got some grant money to do this. At the end of that process, bringing back then those community facilitators to then look at the information that was collated and to then actually help us analyze and then reach some conclusions about what was important. And so at the end of that process, you see this graphic, these were five areas of priority that the community uh, identified that would help create a safer, healthier uh, uh, east side Tacoma. And as you can see, uh, none of them really would look like they're quote health oriented. There's not a health word except healthy food. So we're talking about these upstream, these, these very basic necessities that we perhaps take for granted. And so how it is that we uncover the, that what's important in this case, social connection and celebrating diversity and how does that relate to a thriving community? So again, in this example, how is it that we were able to actually engage the community, invite them to be a part of the decision-making and the analysis, as well as actually making some decisions about priorities and where to move forward. And in this case, uh, they actually then went on and they're in the process of um, renovating some, some land in East Tacoma that was uh, the uh, uh, Tacoma Public School space up by the East Side uh, Community Center uh, that was also shared space with the Puyallup tribe and to create a space that was actually um, integrating native plants and native foods and also just a gathering space. So again, you know, they have the decision, they, they were able to actually then invite other community members into that same process and then also create leadership. The other way in which um, that's sort of been transformed is, then is in terms of teaching. And so this is another example of where um, engaging the students in this work is another part of engagement and, and teaching students what it is to be uh, able to then work with the community in ways that they may not have before. This happens to reflect uh, a final poster presentation from these group of nursing students in which they actually went out and helped to develop questions and then actually interviewed community members and community leaders about what was important around the food system. And this happened to reflect uh, from that earlier slide, one of the important priorities, which is a healthy food system. So this process of engagement is an ongoing process and, and that it can generate other kinds of activities and also relationships uh, that can then be perpetuated. And certainly as, a, as, a, as an educator, how am I then um, being able to integrate that into the classroom and provide this experience for students in a real meaningful way that isn't just coming into a community, doing a project and leaving, but it also is providing value back to the community. Another part of this is actually uh, then a couple of years ago, uh, I received from the um, Office of, of Office and Engagement some funding to then actually then do another project with the community in which we did a very same process. So in this case, this happens to reflect some elders from um, both the Lao, excuse me, the Cambodian and the Vietnamese communities, where we asked them, um, where is it uh, that they have a need for food? And this happens to be a map of East Side Tacoma uh, that shows where they actually put pinpoints. So here was another way in which they can use their voice to tell us and to demonstrate what was important. And here it shows where they actually get their food. So yellow actually demonstrates where they mostly were living because of the Salishan community. Uh, green demonstrated where this arrow, where they would get their food. And then red was where, excuse me, green was where they would like to get their food. And red was where they were actually getting their food. So what we found out was that um, Eastside residents, at least for these, these residents were traveling three to five miles 
to get to a stable source of food, right? So in, in, this, in this sort of activity, in this engagement process, we also went to the community. We actually went up to the Eastside uh, Community Center um, and provided food and incentives for them to be a part of this. Uh, and so in this way, we again, we're listening through to them and with them to understand what were their needs and their, their priorities. I wanna turn though, it's like, well, how does this uh, equate to justice? Um, how does equity uh, really kind of come into play and, and to share what I am seeing as sort of this sort of mental model. And I believe really is, well, how is it that we can think differently about community engagement and our scholarship with our students? Um, and that for me, it's around being able to not just say that we're, we're engaging this in an equitable manner in a fashion, but how are we actually moving toward justice? And particularly now, I think it's important because of what we're seeing with the effects of COVID-19, particularly in BIPOC communities who are uh, bearing the brunt of, of the disease um, and the mortality. Uh, and that there's a real need to understand why that's happening and how is it then that we can respond thoughtfully um, and, 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 and with great humility and with, with cultural relevancy because there's not a one size fits all approach. So I'm gonna share with you then how I've begun to sort of think about this sort of mental model uh, and, and what it is I believe that we need to be grounded in in terms of our work uh, as scholars and as, as educators um, in the community, which is to really think about it from this lens of equity and, and leaning toward and moving towards justice. And in my mind that we have to be conscious of both what helps us to, to move along, what I call facilitators of that, and what are those that are inhibitors. And, and when I look at these uh, at facilitators in terms of adaptability, is when we are working with communities, um, particularly vulnerable communities, how are we adaptable to understanding the needs and also the ways in which we might engage with those communities? That particularly now, given COVID-19, um, we, we cannot go into a community as we did before, right? So how do we adapt? How might we then bring other kinds of tools? Like how are we using Zoom? Um, an example of that I know with my health department partners is they were actually able to then get uh, community Zoom accounts. So now that's available to residents to use free of charge to actually engage with each other. So it brings community uh, leaders together who can then say, Yes, now we have some resource. And so there's an example of how we can, through an equity lens, find ways in which we can adapt uh, and provide uh, support to, to these communities. Another element is, is authenticity. And, and I say authenticity because um, there's an element of transparency that when we do, and I will say when I do this work, is about what am I bringing to this, this, and this relationship? And this really is about the relationship uh, and relationships. And how am I being authentic with what it is that I am both um, able to, to, to bring to the table, what I can support, and also what my motivation is. And I think that's really important that when we're doing this kind of work is we have to be really uh, clear about what is our motivation um, and how are we then um, able to then um, bring some mutual um, agreement and mutual sharing of interest? And I think that that's probably a very hard thing to do as academics and as researchers, particularly have our outcomes that we want to achieve, is that sometimes we are bound by what we plan, right? But where is it that we actually develop those mutually shared goals with the community and that um, and I'll just put out there that you know, for those of us who have who have been or are on the tenure track, that when we engage this work, you know, we want to see product, but we have to also understand that there isn't necessarily a timeline to how this work gets produced or when it becomes completed. And so, where do we find a place where we can mutually share what we need and what our motivation is um, that is also in the best interest and is in um, sync 
with the community's interest. And I think that's where that reciprocity comes in is that we are willing to give up what's, what uh, we can uh, and what we should um, in the interest of the community. And, and in that um, experience humility and to understand that we don't um, have all of the answers um, in this relationship and that we are actually following and not necessarily leading. And I think that's where it's important to then understand well, what is it that's inhibiting what I would say are, are those really key elements of, 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 of good community engagement, which are these assumptions that we bring into these relationships. And underneath that, what are those biases? And, and coming back to uh, what Tanya talked about earlier in terms of, you know, when we think about equity, what does that really mean to understand where are the power differentials that we hold as academics and the positionality and what does that represent in terms of the power and the privilege? And so how is it that we are able to, as researchers, as academics, put that aside um, and to be supportive partners um, versus um, being necessarily always the leaders uh, and to put our self-interest aside in the interest of the community. And I think that's a, it's, it's a very difficult sometimes balancing act given um, our academic um, structure, which in and of itself we know is fraught with um, structure and power and privilege. And how is it that we can um, you know, undo that the, 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 the racist hierarchy that has built those structures. So I think that's really at the core of this community engagement is how are we really dismantling those structural barriers, those structural racist um, um, structures that have, have created uh, that inequity um, and frankly, where we have created harm in communities because it's also about how are we undoing harm and not creating additional harm. And I think that's part of this um, process of, of understanding what our assumptions are and then what are our biases and how is it that we are able to be uh, authentic um, in understanding that and also I think being vulnerable as we've heard before is how are we being able to be vulnerable to admit that that when we have made a mistake, that we've made a mistake. And certainly I have made mistakes and learned through that process with the community and to acknowledge that then I need to learn what it is that I need to do differently. And that's where humility comes into the process is that how is it that I am able to admit that I don't know it all, right? And I think that's part of the premise of this engagement work is that we don't know it all. And in fact, that's why we can and, and, and we should engage with communities so that we can learn about what is important to them. So I'm not quite sure where my time is, but I'm gonna just sort of end here and uh, end you with a, uh, I had, let's see, I had a slide here and I actually wanted to, um, I will just read this to you because I think it actually fell out, um, but it comes from, um, a Boyer model. I'm going to unshare here and just read this to you. I can unshare here. So, um, so, so this comes from um, Boyer in um, Scholarship Reconsidered, um, and who says that the human community um, is increasingly interdependent, and higher education is focused with special urgency on questions. That affect, that affect profoundly the destiny of all. Now is the time to build bridges across the disciplines and connect the campus to the larger world. Society itself has a great stake in how scholarship is defined. And I say that and, and raise that to you all is like to ask yourselves the question about where are you on this continuum of engagement uh, what is our, what are the questions that we have that we should be asking and how is it that we should be engaging with communities to answer those questions and to ask ourselves what is at stake if we don't actually engage on in equitable uh, fashion in an equitable way with these communities. And again, it comes back to how are we actually enabling and creating these environments that are healthy that, that actually then create well-being. And coming back to um, 
uh, to Tanya's earlier, is like, how do we create hope? How do we create hope? So with that, I just, well, I'm gonna end and say thank you. Thank you. Let's offer our real or virtual applause for David. Um, so we're gonna open up for questions. We have about half an hour left of our program. I just wanna say very briefly, amazing how well connected all three of these presentations are um, given the massive diversity in your fields. Um, so I just, want, I just want to take note of that and say, well done UW Tacoma in our hiring practices <laughs> for the amazing continuity and um, cohesiveness of, of our faculty. So and if I could um, have one minute, please, just, just a tiny time. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Tanya, Ed, David, amazing presentations. I learned so much from you and I'm honored to be in this space and time and benefiting from colleagues like yourselves in advancing our institution and, and building the bridges and, and building, rebuilding and reimagining the structures that we want and in the engagement that we need to do both with our students, with our community. And Ed, I do not wanna leave out the larger ecosystem in which we, we live in. So thank you all for great work. It's an honor to be in your presence. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Robin, you have a, uh, your hand up. Did you wanna ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, yeah, I did. I was trying to type it in, but if I can ask it, that'd be lovely. Uh, I'm just really interested of all the panelists have, have been talking about, you know, just really interesting work. And I agree with Ali, it's all kind of connected. But one of the things I sort of wanted to get into this idea of the pedagogy of hands-on learning and hands-on. Uh, and I'm wondering whether all of the panelists kind of co comment on this. It's a very important concept right now because we're trying to define community engaged learning but I think it also applies to uh, pedagogical instruction, especially around this like compelling idea of hope in the classroom. And also all of the work that Ed's done with, with, with research with students. How have you negotiated the space? Do we need to have the phrase hands-on when we are engaging students in our work? Tanya, I propose you go first in, in order. <laughs> oh, goodness. I feel like I need to think about that for a minute. Um, I love the, uh, the spirit of the phrase hands on, right? I know we can grapple with the notion of experiential learning or hands on learning. Um, but I'm going to say from my position as a woman, hands on makes me cringe a little bit. I don't know how else to put it. Um, I mean, I, there might have been a time when that that literal term hands on may, you know, would have made more sense. Um, I don't know in this moment, right, when we talk about the Me Too movement, and the unfortunate interpretations of a phrase like that. Um, I do get that for some of our students that might resonate. That might seem the most practical. Um, so that's what I want to say about the actual term. Uh, but the idea of um, engaged learning in the classroom, in our communities, I think is really important. And, and I, I think it's tied to what our students definitely allude to is, um, is issues of relevancy mm. like, and, and learning that they can see in real time, real world, because they are, I mean, this generation in particular, Gen Z is very practical, right? They're very pragmatic and they're, you know, Unfortunately, too, they're also shaped by uh, narratives of consumption or consumerism. So, you know, as customers of higher ed, especially when, you know, they're concerned about the cost of education, they are thinking about, I'm going to use a business term, and if Shalini's here, she's going to be really proud of me, ROI, right, return on investment, that way outside of my discipline. Um, but, but it, you know, and I don't necessarily want to encourage that, but nonetheless, our students are, are, are asking themselves, if I'm making the sacrifices to be here, right? And even navigating maybe 
hostile or challenging spaces in higher ed, I need to know why, right? I need to know how I'm going to apply what's occurring in the classroom or what we're doing out in the field. Um, and again, on a practical level, right, um, in terms of employment, but what our work is to also help them illuminate and think about, you know, um, the critical thinking skills, the other transferable skills that are going to help them to navigate their lives, to be global citizens, you know, to be um, engaged with their communities. Um, and and, and to, to, I think, David's work, you know, for our students, um, for some of them, those are their communities, right? So that what they're doing in college, they will take back to Salishan, right? They'll take back to, and so, um, so there's, I think there's real promise in that. I, I do think we have to figure out a way of how to capture that, that is, again, not just, I mean, in terms of application relevant, but that is culturally relevant and responsive in the language that we're using. And, you know, maybe, maybe that is the engaged learning is forums with our students about how would you define this thing that we're trying to, um, you know, encourage and promote and, and tell us of what benefit it is to you. Like, how do you imagine it? I would just add, and just first, I think Tanya, your answer was great. I think you just, you sort of hit the nail on the head. And I would, you know, add to it is like, how are students uh, perhaps uh, co-creating that? And I, and I think, you know, what is that quote experience about? And so, um, and with whom, and that, that sense of relevancy. And, and yes, there is sort of the return on investment, quote unquote, particularly when students are within that community, whether they are uh, as guests or whether they actually come from those communities. And so um, I, I think to your point, Robin, it's like, I think it's gonna, it sort of is dependent on with whom that community is you're working. There's no one size fits all, right? And so how is it that you or we, um, first of all, have done our own homework um, as faculty, as, as you know, as, as, however we are uh, helping to set up that framework, because certainly we, what we wouldn't, I just, what I wouldn't want to do is just to say, you know, oh, here's a community and here's a need that looks like it's hands-on learning, and then set the students up, out upon to do it, right? I think that's our responsibility uh, as educators, is how are we actually creating that structure and those sort of those guideposts, but those are also negotiated with the community in which we are uh, engaged with, working with, right? And so I think that's that has been my approach is uh, to, to actually create that structure um, and whatever that quote deliverable is with that with the community. It isn't mine wholly, but my my transparency is you know I would like a, a good learning experience for students, uh, and so we negotiate that, and I think that's part of this engagement is is having uh, that negotiation so it meets everybody's you know needs. Yeah, maybe I'll just chip in with a, a few words about kind of like, I guess how how students interact with research and what experiential research means for the what we work on. Um, you know, I think it's important, you know, and I think both Tanya and David brought brought up something similar to this, you know, students need to feel that real world connection or understand kind of like the practicality or how it applies to someone else, you know, something maybe they're not reading in a book or they're, they're kind of have that more um, A more physical reality of this is the problem. And this is how I interact with it. And this is how I can work on it and contribute and make a make a change. So I, I definitely find that students are motivated by that. I think fundamentally what a lot of, you know, working in this space of data generation, you know, primary data generation and data analysis, um, lots of what we do it intrinsically is set up a peer learning community. That's what our research group is, right? Research group, a really standard term you hear in kind of like the STEM spaces. Um, and you know, I feel like my my research group teaches most of the students most of what they learn when they come and do research, you know, in with us, you know, on these types of 
problems or questions. And I, I just think that's really uh, important. And then, you know, I, I too have a little bit of a issue with the hands-on type term maybe, just because so much of research has nothing to do with like, everybody pictures themselves out in the field collecting a sample, but in reality, it's sitting in front of a laptop with a spreadsheet or reading a whole bunch of things, you know, which, you know, there might not be a hand involved there. It's you and your brain with, you know, the literature for days or months on end. And that's still where lots happens. Um, so it's tricky. I, you know, I mean, I don't want to portray research as something you, that is necessarily physical in that, in that hands type term. Um, so much of it is not, no matter what you do. Um, yeah. I love Ed, I love, I love, and especially your, your, your description of like searching for that chemical in the tire, right? You know, that was hours and hours of gazing, get, looking at studies, looking around, searching for the right one. And, and, uh, hours. That, I wish it yeah. was hours. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So Tom Koontz, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to go ahead and vocalize it? Or do you want me to do that? Sure, I was just struck really, Ed, by the difference between Coho and Chum. So my question is, um, you guys are maybe done. Are you handing the baton to somebody in epidemiology or biology to do follow-up research to see the mechanism inside the fish that makes the Coho get harmed and the Chum not get harmed? Because this would tell us a lot about what other organisms out there might be harmed. So like the pathway of harm, once you figure out this is this is it, he, this is the one who done it, now, like, how does it do it? And what does that mean for like other organs? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's lots of follow-up work going on as you might imagine. Um, obviously I'm not the person that does those biological mechanisms, but that really needs to be done. And in particular, um, we had to do this type of study with live fish, which is, you know, that's what Jen does. She has a fish lab, which is horrible and sad. And, you know, uh, but it's the only way you can kind of like look at problems like this because if you don't know the mechanism especially if you have that complex stormwater mixture there's thousands of chemicals there you can't really run a controlled you can't even do a controlled exposure without knowing what it is so all the toxicology collaborators on this project are very hopeful now that we know what it is you can kind of control the experimental system far better than was able in the past and they're going to look and try and figure that out and ideally get to some cell assay where, you know, some little color indicator that tells you toxic, not toxic. It's this mechanism versus having that need a fish to tell you that. Um, and there's obviously like very significant differences in sensitivity between fish, which itself is like actually a big research challenge. Like what's an appropriate indicator fish or how do you find a problem like this? Um, um, I've been contacted in the last two months by researchers globally who have concerns over three other species of fish that they think explains mortality that they've been working on and trying to understand. So I, I think there's some subset of species out there, probably not even just fish, that are sensitive to what compounds are here. Nobody knows why it's happening quite yet or what the mechanism is, but Hopefully we'll start to learn more now that the coho have told us maybe what to pay attention to the most. Yeah, and I'll just follow up too. I think that's very important. The, um, I'm a scientist and a teacher. I'm not only a teacher, I'm a scientist too. And a lot of the talk around campus is all about teaching, which is great. But I feel like often the science moving out into the world is doesn't get as much attention and investment and so forth. And I just want to call out the idea of what you just said, researchers around the world contacting you. That's only possible because the work that you did and a lot of us do isn't only for our local communities, but it's also going out into the other avenues for books journals and that sort of thing. So the fact that I other mean, people around the world are contacting you, that's sort of the point in a way of the scientific enterprise, right? Our, our communities are multiple. You know, we have so many different communities we're a part of uh, in so many different scales, all the way from very local to very global. Um, and I think, you know, um, when I hear community engage, you know, I think of local and regional things too, but also global communities and, 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 um, that engagement really reaches across very many scales for very many different types of problems. And I, I think that's important too. 
Thank you, Tom. Ali, you have your hand up. Well, I have a very complicated but brief question. <laughs> so here it goes. And just I want to acknowledge that we do, from from perspective of now, looking at community engagement work, it's a global work. So on our campus, a lot of folks are engaged with other places in the U.S. or other places outside the United States that they're working with. But here's a question because I heard in Tanya and David's presentation and Ed talked about citizen scientists. And here's the question. In what way in the work that we do, don't we, we not only we engage with the community, but acknowledge the knowledge that community contributes to our work. In other words, explicitly indicating that. So students, be it in, with students who are in a classroom or in a research work or any form of community engagement, they see that explicit acknowledgement in the model of the reciprocal model that we're talking about. How, did, how does it show up? How do you incorporate it? Uh, where do you fit it into your models? Should we keep going in order? <laughs> okay. I'll give you a really um, simple, practical example. Um, because. And, and maybe a story. Um, long, long ago, one of my favorite educators and student affairs people said to me that no student should walk onto campus and feel like they've stepped into a foreign country. Um, and also said that no student should step into a classroom and feel like they left half of who they are at the door. So um, I offer a questionnaire at the beginning of every quarter about the practical things, what's your major, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but I also include questions about who they are and who their people are and what their skills and gifts are, the assets that they bring to the learning community um, as a way of uh, opening up a conversation and inviting them to um, bring all of who they are, right? I also ask about any barriers they may, may be experiencing and where they see themselves in five years, right? So really trying to address the whole student and um, different ways that, you know, different lived experiences and different ways that they have um, social group identities that might influence how they're engaging with the material. And um, students are always quite generous and forthcoming in their answers and they're really beautiful, right? Some of them will talk about their multicultural ways of knowing, they talk about their ancestors, they talk about leadership roles that they fill in other places, you know, in their faith communities and in their high schools or, or, or whatnot. Um, and it's a good way of sort of attempting to level the playing field, right? Um, and acknowledging um, and, and knowing, right? And it really influences then my future conversations in the classroom because as I read over those questionnaires and I memorize and think about the different assets and gifts, very unique to each student, I can use examples that would give them an opportunity to contribute, right? Um, so it's been really useful for me. I enjoy reading, like probably my favorite part of every class is reading the questionnaires uh, because they come up with just, I mean, it's really wonderful to know who, who our students are and it helps me to develop um, an authentic rapport with them. Yeah, I, I can, uh, I guess I'll so I'll answer this briefly. I mean, um, the citizen science groups have been really critical to kind of a bunch of our work. And, you know, um, I've been really thankful that actually, at least in the water quality space, um, Miller Walker Creek is one of the most well understood urban creeks anywhere around, probably even on the US West Coast, because um, this coho mortality phenomena was happening. King County made a watershed coordinator. Um, and uh, there's actually been a couple of them. But when I came here, I started working with that watershed coordinator. And, you know, um, it involves kind of going out and, you know, sitting in generally some community center basement, you know, on some evening, and then all the people come and, you know, I think just being there for them and uh, kind of building that relationship and explaining kind of who you are and what you're trying to do. And at least, um, you know, there's, a, there's already 10 years of like community engagement with this watershed and this issue. And there are people out in that watershed every single day, counting the fish that came back and counting how many were dying before they were reproducing and things like that. 
And um, I think they were just, you know, at least my perception, uh, they were just so happy that they could um, contribute to almost this work that was much broader than just their watershed. And um, I, I've, I've at least found the Miller Walker uh, community salmon investigation that that's about 50 people uh, up in that watershed. Um, I think they're all proud that they helped solve this. You know, they've been working on it for so long and they were somehow they're a part, part of like figuring it out. Um, and, you know, we're out in their backyard, wash our equipment at night, uh, you know, like they, you know, we park in their driveways. And so, um, yeah, they're just happy to, you know, help in some fashion. Um, and, and yeah, I guess that's been our experience. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of pick up a little bit on that, and, I th and of course, in my, in my work, it, it it varies from community or group. But I'll, one something that I really have strived with this work is to include the community members in the in the teaching, if you will, of students. So, for example, um, last. Last winter, just before we all went into lockdown, um, my, my students worked with community members in Springwood, uh, uh, Springbrook, excuse me, outside of McCord. And um, together they uh, learned how to do facilitation. And so they were in together as, and then they um, facilitated a group of community members together. So, it was a way in which the students could one experience it that quote, quote unquote hands on, but it was also them experiencing the leadership of that community and what they know and what they were bringing to um, address or at least surface and identify problems and issues. And for me, th that's kind of like the best way to make that happen for students to understand that they were also that they are guests in that community um, and that they are learners in that community, even though you know they they're nurses. And that's that piece of positionality I was talking about is how do we pull aside and push aside and that you know that we we're, we are there as learners and and not as leaders. And so that's what I strive for. Uh, when I when I try to do that with students, and certainly in my own work when I'm with with community as well in my research. Thank you, thank you all three responses. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. Or if there aren't questions and the panelists want to share something additional or maybe speak to each other directly. I mean, like I say, I think there were so many cool connections across your presentations. Uh, folks are done with Zoom. <laughs> Zoom fatigue already. It's only week three in our quarter. Um, <laughs> I had a question for David. Um, you, you brought this up a little bit in your presentation about um, outputs and almost document, you know, community engagement is amorphous and kind of hard to draw boundaries around and hard to kind of almost document and communicate. Um, I, I would just like to know more about that, you know, as we, as we transition toward, uh, not transition toward, as we, better communicate our roles as a community engaged campus, you know, kind of what, um, I, I'd love to know just more about your thoughts about understand and document that and communicate that and um, mm -hmm. derive meaningful outputs for those communities we engage with. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Ed, for the question. That's, that, that's kind of a, the, the gold question, right? That's kind of the million dollar question. and. I, I guess what I'll say from my from the work that I have been doing is 
kind of twofold. One is um, one being transparent, particularly if it's with students about what it is I want to be able to accomplish. And then to negotiate that with the partner or with the community and ask, is, is that reasonable or not reasonable, right? Um, and, and, and then to sort of move forward with that and, and try to keep us on pace. And for, so for example, right now with the community partner with students and it's all virtual, this is a community-based project. So the, what we negotiated was, you know, we're, we're gonna review some um, focus group uh, summary statements from focus groups. And we're going to have the students summarize and do some coding uh, and come up with um, what, they, what they are seeing in terms of findings and recommendations, right? I mean, that's, that's also dialed into the course because we have some of those, but negotiating which, what part of that with the partner was really important and, and starting that early. I mean, I started that question back in September um, or actually in the summertime to say, you know, this is kind of, what are we gonna do? So I, I think that's part of this is it, there's a lot of pre-work that has to get done to get to a point where then you feel both um, good about what is going to happen in this case, the experience with students, but also then for the for the partner, um, it's not easy all the time. And I, you know, and certainly from a re when it's certainly research oriented, that's a whole nother negotiation, um, and and then finding out, you know, what within that um, is reasonable for that particular time period. And sometimes it's just okay, quarter one, this is what we can do. This is quarter two. This is quarter three. Um, and then, of course, for, you know, then it's like, how do we demonstrate that back to the university? It's like, yes, I have achieved and met this milestone, right? That, that that's that's kind of the uh, the dilemma, and and it's not perfect. I'll just say it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that um, in that I think this complex and authentic community engagement, it really asks of the institution that we rethink our research methods altogether, right? And especially with regards to outcomes, because they're often surprising. Um, and if deep engagement with the community can certainly determine a very different outcome than you intended. So, oh, the beauty of inductive question versus deductive questions, right? And the and the learning, the iterative process with our students is is in the reflexivity and the adjustments you make all along, right? Um, a really good example is Seth Holmes' work in Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, right? Uh, living on in migrant communities and in camps of farm, uh, you know, migrant farm workers. Um, he went in with lofty ideas and all along his journey, um, the closer he got to, the closer proximity he had to the migrant workers and their families, he began to adjust his expectations when he really learned about their needs, which was very localized and very particular, right? And when there was, there was funding and an opportunity to create change and he let the community lead, um, and really not let, but like stepped out of the way so that the community could lead and have agency, the things that they wanted were very different, right? For them, paving over a pebbled, pebbled road made all the difference, right? And that might seem meager or insignificant to a Western privileged researcher, um, and it wouldn't be what he would have wanted for them, right? Uh, and uh, but it's what they needed in the moment, and it made a huge difference for them on again on a very local level. Uh, so so knowing that right, um, I do think that part of our work as educators and as researchers is also shape reshaping the institution to rethink these practices altogether, and educate for the purpose of tenure and promotion in terms of these standard outputs for research in the social sciences right um, versus this other method and this qualitative approach that um, that is still valuable and in fact I'm going to argue even more valuable um, because it's a true partnership right in terms of um, centering the agency of the community members. Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing to that which is being willing to understand that if the community says no the community says no right um, and and that that is I think um, a hard thing for us to, to, 
to hear and to swallow, right? Because we are up against the, the institution telling us we have to have X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and I would say it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and when I was doing some CBPR work with residents East Tacoma and and saying what you are what you are generating, what you are finding belongs to the community. Can I have access to that after the fact? And that was a conversation I had with them. So that was part of my both vulnerability and my authenticity about I'm going to honor what is your knowledge. And this goes back to all these questions like, how do I acknowledge that it's their knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's their own sense of agency. They could have said, no, you know, we really don't want you to, because this is, you know, for whatever reason. So it, again, it's a negotiation. It's also, I mean, just call it what it is, it's a decolonizing practice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We don't want to just drop in, like parachute, step in, take, right, and come back out for the for the output, right, for the outcome. Um, and so the point being is that community engaged work takes time, patience, and a lot of skill, right? And deepening your knowledge about multicultural ways of knowing. Um, and it's the, and this is the thing we need to teach our students as well. I'm sure, Ed, for you as well, right? Working uh, with waterways and with tribes, right? And teaching our researchers about the cultural and spiritual meaning of salmon here in the Northwest, right? That's also important. And, you know, why are we saving the salmon, right? I mean, there's, there's cultural, right? And spiritual reasons too. So, um, yeah, and, and again, I think, you know, being mindful, I, I understand as we're becoming a more engaged campus, um, that we have an opportunity to do this, frankly, very well. Um, we're a small campus, we do have an engaged, you know, community around us, um, but, but it is a huge responsibility, right? I feel like there's a, a moral and kind of ethical imperative about how we do it. And I, and I trust Ollie's leadership on that. All right, and David's, and so um, I'm glad Thank we're having you. the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Consider me a champion for the cause. That's that's what I am. <laughs> Nelly, I feel like you're you're the one who has to uh, spend the next ten years figuring out um, the answer to Robin's question: How accountable do faculty need to be towards community change? That's another <laughs> doozy. Um, given that we're at the end of our time, we're not going to go there, Robin. But I appreciate you um, raising that question. Um, just in the last few minutes that we have, can we just thank um, all of our award winners for their presentations, their thoughtfulness, their amazing work, um, and just say how um, pleased and honored we are um, to be your colleagues.